Good morning, everyone. Wasn't that the most beautiful Sabbath morning in the world? It was. Still is. It's wonderful to be among friends on the Sabbath day. I want to speak to you this this morning about a message or an epistle to the world that came about at a very unique time in history. It was when the king of the world met the king of the universe. Now, we're acquainted with the letters or epistles in the New Testament that uh, were written to the early church by the apostles. We've been studying them in our Sabbath school pretty regularly. But in the Old Testament, there is this singular epistle or letter that was proclaimed and addressed to the entire world's inhabitants to worship the Most High God. And it was proclaimed by the king of the world. The king's name was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Most Bible readers don't think of him as one of the Bible writers, but there is this epistle that takes up a whole chapter in the book of Daniel, Daniel 4 where Nebuchadnezzar stands and addresses everybody in the world. So let's begin by reading the introduction, shall we? Let's turn to Daniel 4, and we'll start by reading verses 1 through 3. Daniel 4, 1 through 3. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his hinds, And how great are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now what makes this passage so extraordinary is that Nebuchadnezzar is talking about the creator God of the universe in heaven, not Marduk, the king of the Babylonians, or the God of the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar rules on the shoulders of other great universal monarchs, like Nimrod, the first world conqueror, the one who openly rebelled against God after the flood, known to history as Ninus. He and his infamous wife, Semiramis, deified themselves before God, and they put into operation a religious system that we know now as paganism, that sought to be a universal worldwide religion. They set themselves up as gods, gods of lust, sensuality, drunkenness, and every kind of excess. And their religion was designed to tear down everything that was held sacred by the patriarchs. It was total rebellion. Another great Babylonian monarch that predated Nebuchadnezzar was Hammurabi, famous for his just rule of law and legal systems that form the basis of all national codes even today. It gave women rights. It put limits on cruelty and retribution. It stressed the rule of law over privilege, 
or wealth or might. Nebuchadnezzar began his rule just after his father Nabal Palasser had conquered the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, inadvertently fulfilling the prophecy of the Jonah story. Nebuchadnezzar aspired to conquer like his father. So in searching around, he decided to bother Syria, the kingdom of Israel and Judah, and the rest of the Levant region. Conversely, the Lord God of the universe decided to employ Nebuchadnezzar as his personal servant to do his will. And God tells of his plans to the prophet Jeremiah. For Nebuchadnezzar, it turns out to be a bumpy ride. God begins by getting Nebuchadnezzar's attention by sending him a dream. <clears throat> Not just a weird fluctuation of brainwave dreams. Uh, this was a vision in virtual reality. And Nebuchadnezzar was blown away by it. But strangely enough, as soon as he dreams it, he forgets it. And for the life of him, he cannot recall it. You wonder if this is the beginning of his memory problem that he has later. Maybe so. It's hard to say. Enter Daniel, who tells the king that what he saw was an image, whose head was of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Then falls a great stone that smashes the image to dust. The stone enlarges and fills the earth. This, of course, is the image that we know of as the image of Daniel 2. We know it as the prophecy that lays bare the political history of the world. Complete and foretold. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Let's read Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Uh, let's turn back to Daniel 2, and we'll start reading verses 37 through 40. Daniel speaking. This is Daniel 2, 37. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. And a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. Nebuchadnezzar is awestruck not only by the vision, but by the dream's interpretation. And he blesses the God of Daniel. He likes being that head of gold. But on further reflection, he returns to the beliefs of his pagan religion that places Babylon as the eternal kingdom. Babylon is the center of the world and a kingdom that has no end. Well, of course, every kingdom aspires to that, but uh, Babylon had already held sway for centuries, ever since Nimrod's father, Cush, had instigated the Tower of Babel, leaving Cush with the epitaph of God of Confusion because of the language turmoil that he caused. 
indeed part of the Isagula, the center square of the city of Babylon, was supposedly the platform foundation of the tower itself. So Nebuchadnezzar decides that the dream of the image needs editing. Let's just get rid of those other kingdoms and uh, make the whole entire image of gold, shall we? Babylon the Great and forever. In fact, he builds his own gold statue in the plain of Dura and commands everyone to worship it. Well, that was easy. I mean, after all, Nebuchadnezzar has been crowned to be Marduk's emissary, and he's supposed to do stuff like that. Until the God of the universe, who defies being edited at all, comes down personally to rescue his children from the king's superheated gas furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar is forced to bless the high God of the universe a second time. You can read this story in its detail in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar's letter or epistle or proclamation that we referred to earlier comes towards the end of his 42-year reign after he receives a second dream from God, which is also a virtual reality experience, but it doesn't look as good for Nebuchadnezzar this time. Now between dream one and dream two, Nebuchadnezzar has re been rebuilding Babylon, Ishtar Gate, New Palace, Hanging Gardens, enlarging the city to twice its previous size, and it has emerged as the wonder of the world. There is nothing else like it anywhere. And it is so complete that historians call it the Neo-Babylonian kingdom going forward because it was just such a total restart of Babylonian influence. Well, that brings us to the second dream of Daniel chapter 4. And it becomes the setting for Nebuchadnezzar's unprecedented epistle. We've already read the introduction of it in Daniel 4, 1 through 3. Now Nebuchadnezzar will tell us about this second dream sent by God in his own words. So if you'll turn with me to Daniel 4... We'll read verses 10 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar speaking. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, <clears throat> and all flesh was fed by it. I saw in my visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher a holy one coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, <clears throat> Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. 
and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he wills, and sets over the lowest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Daniel steps up again with the interpretation of the dream. Daniel 4, 24 through 27. This is Daniel speaking. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they have given the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Retribution hangs over this king, and then it all happens. Daniel 4, 28 to 31. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, it is, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. The sure fulfillment. Daniel 4, 33. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. That same hour, he loses it. It all slips away. His ability to recall anything, his ability to plan anything, his ability to use language, he can't even remember his name. Suddenly, his memory has vanished. For seven years, he lives like an ox. Think of it. At the end of seven years of this madness, Nebuchadnezzar gives his testimony. Daniel 4, 34 through 37. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, he does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, 
no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom. An excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth, his way is justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. I would like to read a comment from Ellen White from her book, Prophets and Kings, page 521. God's purpose, that the greatest kingdom in the world should show forth his praise, was now fulfilled. This public proclamation, in which Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the mercy, the goodness, and authority of God, was the last act of his life recorded in sacred history. Well, that was Nebuchadnezzar's life. Uh, what happened to Daniel? Uh, no th nothing is uh, known really of Daniel's activities during Nebuchadnezzar's incapacity or even his activities after the king regained his kingdom. But we do know that uh, Daniel had a chance to watch Nebuchadnezzar's empire become succeedingly weak and corrupt under the kings that followed him, mostly through assassination. Evil Merodach, Nurgal Sharuzer, Nebashi Marduk, and Nabonidus. Daniel would have seen Nabonidus appoint his son Belshazzar to rule Babylon while he set out to conquer Tima in Arabia. At least he was smart enough to get out of town because Babylon had become a rough place for kings to survive in. It was during the first three years of Belshazzar's reign that Daniel received the visions of Daniel 7 and 8. Daniel sees the little horn power arise a thousand years before it arrives. Then he looks past our time looks past us to the second coming itself. Daniel was summoned to read the handwriting on the wall the night Babylon fell in 539 BC. He, was the, he then became the chief counselor to the Persian crown and was no doubt instrumental in equating the new monarchs of the prophecies concerning Israel's soon-to-be um, ending exile. An attempt on his life with the lion's den story happened during this time. Daniel continued to receive important visions during the rule of Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Great of Persia. Well, as captivating as this history is and the story of Nebuchadnezzar, we shouldn't lose sight of the important message that he left for us, left for us to study and to understand and to take to heart. The message of Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation is that there is a God in heaven who rules the earth. Nothing gets by him. He notices it all. Can't we be glad for that? Nebuchadnezzar's message is for us. There is a God who rules and directs it all, no matter what happens. No matter how weird or ugly things get between now and the second coming, God rules. 
Nebuchadnezzar's praise anthem to God compares well to some of the great messages and passages of Scripture. Nebuchadnezzar was king where paganism began in the world. But in Daniel 4, he is heard loudly proclaiming, The God of heaven is a great God above all. That God is good. That God is eternal. That proclamation must have shook the world. Well, uh, what about us now in 2018? We're here and he was way back there. As we've been studying last day events in the Sabbath school lessons earlier this year, I was struck by the similarity of Nebuchadnezzar's first worldwide proclamation to worship God with the very last worldwide proclamation given to the world shortly before Christ comes the second time. Notice the similarity between the two. The last proclamation to the world is given to us in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. If you would like to follow there with me, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So there will go out this universal command to worship God and give him glory. For he is sovereign over the earth by right because he is the creator. Nebuchadnezzar joins other great spokesmen for the Most High. Enoch, Noah, Moses, David, Isaiah, the Old Testament prophets, and the New Testament apostles, all joining that last day angel in proclaiming that message to the world. The message is the same. That is, to reverence God and give him glory. May the Lord be close to us as we worship him. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we want to add our testimony to King Nebuchadnezzar's and to worship you and give you glory. May your name be praised on the earth today. We pray for your blessings as we worship you on your Sabbath. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.